our uh, second uh, seminar from the Holden Ag Commission. I'm Jim Dunn. I'm the vice chairman of the Ag Commission. Our chairman, Steve Aquila, uh, couldn't be here today, um, but he sends his regards. The Holden Ag Commission's been in place for about nine years, um, since 2009. We're, um, one of our charters is to try and uh, help uh, sustain and promote agriculture in Holden, and this is one of the ways we do it with uh, hosting seminars. And um, a couple of our other members, Eileen Charbonneau, actually did the work today. And uh, another member will be here a little bit later. Um, oh, me. And, and I'm sorry, Chris Hugo, our new member, is also representative of the Red Barn, who's nice enough to uh, let us use their space for these events. So without uh, further introduction, I'll introduce uh, Jennifer Poirier, who has been raising dairy goats for 30 years in Holland Mass in uh, supporting 4-H and all kinds of uh, state boards and knows about all there is to know about um, goats and is going to try and pass on some of that information. I just would uh, let you know that on our town uh, AgCom website um, there's a uh, link to a, a, a regulation summary I guess you'd call it that talks about uh, the rules and regulations for raising uh, poultry in particular, but almost all of that applies to, to animals in Holden. So if you have interest in pursuing this further, um, you can look that up. And, and really it comes down to two things, zoning and your neighbors. Jennifer. Thank you. Well, as you mentioned, I've been raising dairy goats now for about 30 years. Um, grew up with them. And then uh, around 1990, my son was diagnosed with um, severe ear infections, asthma, bronchitis. And so that started us on a road to uh, seeking alternatives uh, for his health. Um, and one of the suggestions was that we try goat milk and maybe he was lactose intolerant. And so after we got our first uh, two goats and started milking, it was like a miracle. No more ear infections. Um, his asthma and his bronchitis both cleared up and he's never been, uh, had trouble with it since. He's uh, now 28 years old, he's my oldest son, and uh, he still is lactose intolerant, so if he wants to eat ice cream, he lives in Georgia, so he doesn't always have the option of having gelato, but uh, if he eats ice cream, he usually tries to plan it so there's a weekend behind it, so, um, but uh, we have we've, um, raised three sons and probably, oh, I'd say close to a thousand goats now on our property through the years. Um, we currently have about 70 head hurt of, um, mostly made up of La Mancha, La Mancha Nubian breed. Um, and uh, we also have added Nigerian dwarfs. For those of you that are really excited about the miniature ones, I need to stress one thing right up front. The smaller the goat, the higher the fence. So if you have neighbors and you're considering, I live in Holden, if I get Nigis, this would be wonderful. Don't get Nigis. If you are worried about neighbors being upset with you, Nigis always escape. Okay, so we are constantly chasing our Nigis. I love them, but they are troublemakers. So we call them our rascally Nigis. Um, but they are, uh, they're, they're a lot of fun to watch. They get into a lot of mischief. I bought my two calmest ones because I did do the Massachusetts Outdoor Expo last weekend. And no matter how we built our fences, and we had high stock fencing, and then we lined it with this kind of fencing, they still seem to find a way out. So Precious and Penelope stayed home today to take a day off. But uh, we did bring three different animals with us today. We have two Nigerian dwarfs, the female, uh, closest to you is a blue-eyed female and then we have our little one which um, actually wasn't born on my farm but one of my friends sent me a picture and yeah I was I was lost I had to get her so uh, she's joined our family as well um, my doe in the middle that's Dee 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 is a La Mancha Nubian cross the advantages of that particular breed is that they're a quiet breed so uh, Nigis are a little more talkative. You'll hear them probably somewhere along the way once they get bored with not eating their hay. Uh, but they're a little more vocal. So, uh, usually when I start one of these workshops, I like to ask people, what is the purpose of your interest in goats? Um, the purpose will help define um, what your goals are. Maybe you're here just because you want to learn more about goats 
You don't have the opportunity to have a farm. Well, I have a solution. I have a farm. I'm 40 minute, 45 minutes south of you, right in Holland, Mass. Um, about 15 minutes out of Sturbridge, so it's not bad. Um, and you're always welcome to come and volunteer at my farm. Uh, I have the opportunity to bottle feed babies from February till probably late May. We have babies um, that are bottle fed. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a few minutes, but that's an option that you have. You also can learn to milk um, at my farm. Um, I also have a sister who lives in Millbury. So for those of you that are out that way, um, she does take volunteers too, and she has a little bit of everything from rabbits and chickens to uh, horse and, um, and goats. So she's also an option that you might be able to tap into. A lot of chickens. Um, so, once you define your purpose, um, you can decide what type of breed you might be interested in. If you don't have it, you're welcome to use that chair if you like. Um, we have, um, so, are you here because you're interested in learning more? Are you here because you're looking for a milk animal, a meat animal, fiber animal for spinning their fiber, um, working animals? Um, a lot of people don't like the sound of that. Goats love to be kept busy. So if you put a harness on them and let them till your garden in a natural way, they'll love it. Just watch them what they eat along the way. So this is early season. Um, their stool can be composted immediately, so you never have to worry about it burning your crops. So um, companion animals. A lot of people will say, listen, I want somebody to keep my horse or my alpaca company. So definitely companion animals. Some of you may be interested in heritage conservation. Um, with heritage conservation, there are specific breeds that are going extinct. And so some of those breeds may appeal to you. They may not be high milk producers. They may not be they're more of an all-purpose breed. Um, but um, definitely we need to conserve some of our older breeds that have, um, that have been losing popularity. Um, also, brush and weed management. Um, that used to be near the end of my list. And so as you see with my outline, that's where it falls. But that seems to be the hot topic now. The last two years, um, brush and weed management, people are looking for a goat to come in, eat their lawns down, chew their trees down, clear land for them, get away brush and especially poison ivy. They are very good at that. Um, you can use electro netting and electro netting can be set up with just a small charger and that'll keep the goats in the area. It also keeps some of your neighbors stray dogs or predators from the goats. It can't be depended on um, overnight, but it can be kept for, you know, basic, basic protection. Um, other options are carting and packing. Not as popular in Massachusetts as it is in other states. Um, I will say that the La Mancha breed especially because the males get to be a little larger size, make a really good cart animal. So um, I had a buck that was still intact. And when I say intact, it means he wasn't neutered. Um, and he may, even the first time I put him in a halter, it was a great, great work animal. So he just pulled that cart. The biggest thing was I couldn't be behind him. He was so used to following me that I had to walk alongside him and let him pull for me. So uh, I never even had to teach him. He just really knew what to do. Um, and packing is when you go hiking. A lot of people will put packs on their goats and take them into areas. State forests, a lot of your um, state forests will allow goats into them. So just check with the state forest you might be going camping in um, or the state you're going camping in. And you can also take your animals packing in a lot of states. Uh, in California, they use a lot of goats to maintain small brush, especially the, um, the scrub oaks because they grow so quickly and that causes a lot of forest fires. So goats are used to maintain the lower brush in heavily dense uh, populated areas. So just going to talk briefly about the benefits of goat milk. And I know if I'm talking too fast, slow me down. But I know that you're only going to be here for a couple hours and I'm used to giving this chat with about a three hour um, spiel. So. Um, the benefits of goat milk. Uh, i got to do a plug for us dairy people. I do run a dairy. Uh, the name of my farm is the Shepherd's Gate Dairy Goat Farm, and I'm located in Holland, Massachusetts. Um, I'm in lower south central Massachusetts, right on the, uh, in the Pioneer Valley, right in the corner of the Last Green Valley. Um, so I have to put the plug in for milk, right, regardless of whether you guys like it or not. <laughs> 
uh, milk itself. Um, goat's milk will vary in flavor. So if you're thinking about milk, I will ask you that when you're deciding what type of breed to get, ask to sample the milk from whatever farm you're getting the animal. Because that's going to give you an idea as to the quality of the milk. If you're buying a kid, its mother's genetics created the genetics your kid is going to have when you take it home. If that animal has a low butter fat, it's going to have a stronger, gamier flavor. So feel free to uh, ask for a sample of their milk. Um, you might even want to be present when they're milking so you can define whether that is properly handled. Um, that'll make a big difference uh, in the flavor. So the benefits of goat milk, um, digestion. Uh, the fat in goat's milk is five times smaller than that found in cow, so it's easier to digest. Um, it has a less complex protein, so that's also easier to digest. Um, she's just exhibiting, while she's in this pen, she's not usually a leader, but because she's the biggest one in this pen, she wants to let them know she's boss. So she's not really hurting them, she's just establishing herself. Um, if one of my other little Nigies were here, they'd, they'd retaliate. So, um, it's not really just a breed characteristic, she's just doing what goats normally do. Um, so, it's less allergenic, it has, um, like I mentioned, no complex proteins, um, which help to stimulate allergic reaction. Um, it's higher in energy, it's higher in vitamin A, Bs, uh, the riboflavin, the Ds, the calcium, the iron. So in all of these things you have a higher, it's also high, higher in uh, choline and incitol, which also help to prevent diabetes. So, um, so there are some real health benefits. Um, my aunt has um, leukemia and she has been treated on Gleevec, which is a chemotherapy drug every day for about the last eight or 10 years. And uh, so we found that she also started getting a, a blood disease, a red bone uh, issue, a red blood cell issue. And so by giving her three glasses of milk a day, we were able to stop her from having to have Procrit shots, which cost like $4,000 a shot. So it really does help build up your red blood cells. So it helps to build your immune system. Um, it doesn't suppress the immune system because it doesn't cause the formation of phlegm. So you can drink a glass of milk and still sing in the choir at church. So that's a big plus for those of you that have grown up in a choir. You've always been told don't drink milk before you come to sing. Well, you can drink goat milk and you're okay. Um, goat's milk is alkaline, not acid. So it's much easier on the digestive system. It helps to fight people that, people that have a lot of acid reflux. Goat milk will help with that. It also helps to cure ulcers for the same reason. Uh, because it is um, an alkaline, not an acid. It increases the pH in the bloodstream, as I mentioned. Um, and then, like I also mentioned, the silicon, chlorine, and fluorine also help. Um, they're actual germicides, and they also help with the prevention of diabetes. So, um, those of you that have had goat milk soap, you also know it's beneficial for the skin because it helps to sloth off dead skin cells, and then it replenishes the skin. Other benefits, some of you may not like me mentioning this, but some of you may be considering meat goats. Meat goats, um, goat meat is, um, is lower in calories, fat and cholesterol. Uh, goat meat is about 122 calories compared to chicken at 162, beef at 179, pork at 180, and lamb at 175. So it is lower in calories, fat, and cholesterol. It's recommended by the American Heart Society as a really good meat to eat. Um, it's higher in iron than beef, pork, lamb, and chicken, and it's higher in potassium and lower in sodium. So there are some meat benefits as well for those of you that might be considering that. For those of you that are vegetarian, forget that I just said that, <laughs> because we do have a mixed group here and I don't want to offend anyone, but we need to address all the issues that people might be interested in goats. And breeds will make a big difference in what you're going to get. Um, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, the other benefits that we get is outside activities. Um, my three sons grew up um, taking care of goats. And I will say, not that I want to be a proud mother, but my children are not lazy. 
It helps children to learn responsibility. It gives them the ability to nurture and care for something. And so I think that um, children raised with kids um, are, are a benefit. Um, they do get a lot of outside activity. It keeps them from playing um, gaming and watching TV all day. So it definitely draws them out. And uh, this girl just met the goats this week, and then it was her mother had to drag her away from my house. So obviously she came back as my volunteer this week um, because of that. So um, goat milk um, also makes a really great yogurt. It's really good on your digestive system. So that's another option that you can do. Um, compost. Everyone worries about your your um, the footprint we're going to leave on this earth. They're worried about um, you know, your green, your green effect. Goat manure is like rabbit pellets, okay, just slightly larger. Um, it is low in nitrogen, so it can be used immediately on your plants. It is almost the perfect fertilizer for roses, so those of you that have beautiful rose gardens, uh, goat manure makes a great, you just take the beans from your animals and spread them around your bush. It will not burn them. So it's a good option. Um, for those of you that might be interested, maybe here because you're a spinner, uh, their fiber can also be spun into yarn uh, and used in knitting and weaving um, on fiber animals. These obviously are uh, dairy breeds, and so what the dairy breeds do get, some dairy breeds get um, some cashmere fiber. So if you have a dairy breed, that doesn't mean you can't eat them. It doesn't mean that you can't collect fiber from them. It means that that is not the purpose of their breeding. Their breeding has been focused on um, milk production, and some of those pets in every category, pets are, pets are um, definitely a plus. Um, but um, deciding what breed you want will really be based, you don't want an Angora goat and decide you're gonna milk it. You can milk an Angora goat, but their production is lower. So if you're looking for milk, you probably don't want to buy an Angora. You want to buy a La Mancha, a Sana, and a Toggenberg based on the taste of the milk and the quality that you want. But I just wanted to go over really quick some of your major breeds. We have the Sanin goat, and the Sanin is um, pure white goat. Um, when Sanins have a baby that are born of color, they have now been accepted as a separate breed, and they're called Sable. So that has been opened up now. Um, the Sonnen is your biggest milker. These you can compare to your Holstein cows. They're going to give you the highest lactation, but they're lower in butter fat. So the flavor is not the same. Um, the flavor is going to be a little thinner. The milk is going to be a little thinner. So the thing about butter fat, butter fat, a lot of you are like, oh good, I want something with low butter fat. Butter fat maintains the flavor of the milk. So the lower the butter fat, the more absorption of odor from your environment. All right, so the Toggenbergs um, have a specific color requirement also. They're usually in a liver brown to a chocolate, and they have white facial stripes and white markings. Um, so that's, that's what we have there. Um, these are a very friendly breed. They've been around for a long time, but then again, they also can get a very long shaggy coat on some of them. So some people find that appealing. Um, this is a larger Swiss breed, and again, they're lower in butterfat. Uh, Oberhostly, considered one of the smaller breeds of your larger dairy breeds. Um, lo smaller in body frame. Um, they only run um, about 30 to 34 inches. They only run about 100 to 150 pounds at max. Um, they have a really gentle disposition. They're a good source of milk, and they're a little higher in butterfat. Um, this breed is specific also. They're either black or they're a roan red and black. So they can be only two colors, either pure black or black and red. Then we have our French and our, and our, um, and our American Alpines. Um, there's also British Alpines. Um, Alpines, usually we, we think of them as salt and pepper colored. We see a lot of them in those colors. They're really flashy dough. Um, their butter fat runs a, in the same range as your togs and your sonins with a little more butter fat. So you're getting a little sweeter milk with this particular breed. It's a larger breed. These ones um, have erect ears. 
Um, the other ones that we spoke about, all of them have erect ears either. Erect ears are like the Nigis have, where their ears come forward. Um, and this is one of the older breeds. Um, we had this, one of our first goats was a French Alpine. I absolutely loved her. Um, she was super sweet. And then we have Nubian. Nubians are our all-time favorite for babies, for a lot of people. Um, they're very, very long ears. So these, these uh, where the rest of those breeds that I just listed are more Swiss, so they're more of a mountainous breed. This breed um, often doesn't have an undercoat. So this is more of an Asian African um, animal. Its ancestry comes from that part of the uh, that part of the world. Um, this breed has long ears, which means that they they have a larger vascular system to cool off. So it's extremely um, a benefit in the south to have an animal with long ears. In the north, I feel like we do have an advantage with the La Mancha for just the opposite reasons because. The only thing you have to watch with these is because some of your Nubians that have a correct ear, a correct ear will come out past their nose. Um, and so uh, if they have the correct length on their ear, the longer the ear, the higher they're rated in showing. Um, these animals can suffer from frostbite. So you want to be careful when they're drinking water in the winter that you Vaseline the edge of their ears or you make sure that the ears are dried if you see them getting wet a lot. Um, because those can get frostbitten, they also can get caught in branches. So just be aware of that with the long. The other thing that Nubians, they're a super sweet breed, but they're more vocal than some of your other breeds. So the Nubians um, are, are known to be a little more stubborn. I would recommend, um, I would recommend um, that you start walking them at a very young age to get them used to being handled because they're a little more cautious with the world around them. Um, I do have some, I did bring Nubians in on my herd and I do have some half breeds and anyone with the longer ear automatically carries the genetic wear. They get a little more nervous. So, um, La Manches are the breed um, that I currently have a large variety of. Um, I chose the La Manches not because um, I was drawn to it. Actually, it was quite the opposite. I went to purchase La Manches and Nubians and uh, I went to a farm and the lady said, I'll give you a good deal on my La Mancha. I'm sorry, I said, I said La Mancha, didn't I? I'm an Alpine and Nubian. And I went to a farm and a lady says, I'll give you a good deal on my La Manchas. And I said, oh no, they're funny looking. They got short ears. Um, I'd only seen pictures of them in a book. I'd never seen them in person. And uh, I went to a farm and this gorgeous black and white spotted animal comes running up, first goat to greet me. Her face is in my face. She wants to be petted. She's loving on me and I'm petting her. And suddenly I realized, oh, you're a La Mancha. You don't have ears. It was like an afterthought. So I think that that's something that most of us can overcome. Um, La Manchas have up to a two inch ear. They kind of reap the benefits of several different varieties of goats because um, they've been bred to every major dairy line. So their ancestry goes back to Spain, whereas we've covered um, Asian ancestry and the Swiss. Um, the La Mancha's ancestry goes back to the Spanish Inquisition. When Spaniards came into Mexico, they brought goats with them, and some of those feral herds made their way into California. There was a lady out there around the late 1920s who fell in love with them. She saw these goats, she said, looked like they were teddy bears. She captured them and then bred them to the major dairy breeds, creating this line. In 1958, it was recognized as an individual breed itself. So it has a really unique history. Um, it has newer genetics, so to speak. There are more breeds that people are doing a lot of crosses now. But um, this is a breed that's um, reaped the dairy world's genetics. So, uh, so it is a nice dual purpose animal. It's a little smaller than some of your other dairy breeds as well. They only run, at the most, about 28 inches on your females. And that would be a big female. I have some does that stay around 120 pounds their whole life, and then others that um, will max out um, around one. So now we're gonna talk about the other breed that I added in, mostly out of weakness. Um, I was teaching for uh, Northeast Organic Farmers Association two years ago, and I had a class coming up in January, in the winter. And uh, they called me and said, you're bringing baby goats, right? I said, no, definitely not. 
You signed me up in October, I said, and I didn't breed early enough to have babies in January. That's usually the time I leave for Georgia to visit my grandchildren. So I said, no, I'm I, not planning on it. And they said, we really want baby goats. We really would appreciate you bringing baby goats. So I said, well, check with a couple friends. Nobody had them. So long and short of it is, I ended up adopting four little um, baby, five little baby Nigis. Four of them were a little over a month old. Um, and I also adopted a five-month-old bump. And I had a friend who was supposed to take them off my hands. It was only supposed to be a project, a temporary project, so I wouldn't introduce more lines into my herd. Well, she took too long. And then finally I decided she really didn't want them, so I'd have to keep them. So I do have Nigis. Um, they are a constant challenge to my farm, which are set up for larger breed animals. Um, but they do fit on my milk stands, and, uh, and they can slip through uh, stock fencing, so keep that in mind if you're going with cattle panel. You're going to have to line the cattle panel if they're babies. If you've got adult Nigis, they'll stay inside that fence. Some of them are so agile, that particular female could jump up and walk on this if she wanted to. Um, I have seen a couple of my does actually do that, so they're very agile. Um, they have a different voice. Their voice is more of a quiver, so they're more like me, me, and uh, they make an interesting noise. They're a little different than some of your other goats. Um, so they are a little mouthier and a little bossier, um, but I do like their rascaliness, so I, I tolerate it. But these are a miniature dairy breed. I do have one doe that's giving me about a half gallon a day when she's in prime production, so she's a pretty good milker i will say that the first year fresheners don't expect that expect about a half a cup to a cup of milking um Nige's, um when they're when they're young don't produce a lot of milk so it's something that they gain as they get a little more mature about four to six years old most goats will give a good milk production um i think we're up oh, we're going to talk about pygmy really quick Pygmy goats, the difference between pygmy and Nigerian dwarfs. Nigerian dwarfs have small body type and small legs. Nigerian dwarfs are um, considered a meat type breed. Most people here keep them as a pet miniature, but the country they originate from, um, in Africa, they actually were used as a meat animal. So they have a lot of muscle mass that they have. Um, and they're an extremely friendly goat. So you see them at a lot of petting zoos and stuff. And once again, smaller the goat, the higher the fence. Um, then we have some crosses. I'm not gonna go into all the crosses. We have kinders that are a new thing that people are doing, basically taking uh, dairy type and, and crossing them with pygmy and Nubians. And then we have the Angoras. Angora goats um, have long fiber. Um, they originate from Turkey. A lot of um, sweaters and things are made with them, with their fur, rugs especially, with this particular breed. And then we have cashmeres. Cashmeres technically are not a true breed. They're a crossbreed to produce the undercoat of the animal. So you'll notice these longer hairs with darker hairs below, or in the picture of the white goat, it's kind of hard to see, but the cashmere, the hairs are actually growing out. So in um, La Mancha, they will grow these light, white, curly hairs underneath for the winter. And usually they stay shorter than their guard hairs. In the case of cashmeres, their, their cashmere fiber outgrows their guard hairs. So that can be collected by brushing, um, preferably not shearing with cashmeres. You want to shear your angoras but your cashmeres you want to brush out. So it is a labor intense job, but a lot of people enjoy them. They're a quiet, smaller bodied animal in most cases. Uh, Angoras again. And then Nigoras are crossing. Once again, we're doing the thing where we cross Nigerians with Angoras and then we call it Nigora. So, and then just want to make sure that I touch a little on heritage breeds. San Clements. Um, were, are endangered. They were feral until the 1980s. Um, they were from San Clement Island. Um, these goats, uh, basically out in California, um, 
first first settlers, people that did a lot of um, a lot of um, time on the sea, um, introduced these goats to this island in order to be able to go and hunt for food and have them populate on that island. And um, they decided to start to in, in order to to uh, get them off the endangered list, they started offering them for breeding. So these animals are now offered, um, for those of you that might be interested in a heritage breed. They're a great browser. So, and then everybody always wants to know, do you have the fainting goats? Fainting goats are my to myotonics. Basically that means that they have a genetic imperfection, that when they're frightened, their muscles seize. They get stiff, they don't move. Their fear kind of seizes them up. Some of us feel like that sometimes. Well, this particular goat can't move until it relaxes itself. So if it's not standing straight, they will tip over and they will be stuck upside down until they calm down. So this breed particularly is known as a meat breed because every time they do that, they tenderize their meat. So the more you frighten them, the more muscle they build. So, <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, so, but they are a beautiful animal and they are an animal that should be protected. They, they're they not um, endangered, but they've been on threatened for many years. It was, um, they were discovered around 1880 in Tennessee. They said that a traveler came through, he had goats. Um, he left town in the morning and there were some goats left behind. And so some of the local farmers adopted those goats and then they realized that these goats weren't like any other goat they'd ever owned because when they got scared, they would fall down. Or as in Texas, they call them Texas stiff legs, Tennessee fainting or Texas stiff leg. In Texas, they bred them to meat breeds and so they call them the, the stiff legs. So everyone's gotta have their own name on there. Borer goats are your major um, breed. It's more recently brought to the United States from Africa. The boar breed have distinct two-tone coloring. So they have, um, they have the brown or red heads on a white body. And then we have only, almost through the breed, sorry. Savannas are huge African goat. Um, this breed is a meat type breed. Savannas have a very large face. They're very reminiscent of the Nubian in structure but they build up a lot of muscle mass. The difference with the borer and the savannas is if you're going to raise animals for me, you have to keep in mind the market that you plan on selling to because these particular breeds are especially popular with people from Africa and things like that that are used to having them as a part of their ethnic culture because it's a lot more, their, their, their meat is marbleized with a lot of fat. So they're a lot more reminiscent to a lamb in the cooking style, whereas with the um, with the um, traditional breeds like Nubian and things like that, you have more of a European market, uh, people that are Portuguese and, and other Hispanic countries um, that are gonna be interested in those. So for those of you who are vegetarian, just erase what I just said. So, the Spanish goat is basically the feral goat that's been traveling through the United States for the last um, hundred, last few hundred years, and they are they are the feral breed that came in from Mexico, and uh, they're developed specifically for browsing and grazing, and they are also a meat breed. And then we have the Kikos. The advantage that the Kikos have is that they have they're from New Zealand, and they're very resistant to parasites. So that is an advantage if you're doing a meat braid. The Kikos are resistant to parasite. Um, if you want any of these breeds as pets, they do make a great pet. They're just gonna need to be fed a little more than some of your other dairy or miniature breeds. And then we have Tennessee meat. So those are your basic breeds um, that I wanted to quickly go over with you. Um, so I get my time here, okay. Talk a little bit about housing. What should you put your goats in? What, what do they need to keep them safe? Um, goats need food and water. Like every other living being, they need food and they need water. They do not need grain, okay? They need food and they need water. That does not mean they have to have grain. A lot of people will go down to tractor supply, buy a bag of feed, like they feed their dog, and they'll pour the feed in there and think that's it. 
If you do that, your goat will die because it will get rheumatitis because that is made with grains that have already been, um, we call them uh, middlings um, or, di um, or, or um, products, byproducts um, of an industry. So in other words, um, the beer industry, they use corns and other grains to make their alcohol. Um, those are then sent, the wheat middlings and stuff, the stuff that's already been pressed out, they've gotten what they want. They then send that scrap roughage to make grains. That's fine if it's in proper balance, but if you're just having a pet animal, if you get a good second or third cut hay, that should be enough to maintain them once they've reached their, their natural weight, okay? As a kid, you can supplement with grain. If you're gonna supplement with grain, please read the label. Everybody wants to give them two scoops. It says a half a cup for maintenance. They really mean a half a cup for maintenance. Most people that get animals kill them because they love them, not because of neglect. Most of us think, oh, somebody let their goat die because they neglected them. There are some people out there that would do that, but most of us put our animals at risk by overfeeding them. Okay, in nature, these animals will browse, they'll eat things. This bush here, anybody know what this is? This is a wild holly, is what we always called it. I don't know what the, the Latin name for it is. This is a poisonous plant. If your plants have red berries on them, they're probably poisonous. The birds know that, um, and the birds can eat them because they have a gizzard, and they eat a lot of minerals, so that helps to cut down on the poisons. Goats, if you keep baking soda in their barn, if they eat something toxic, will go over and they will eat the bacon soda themselves, neutralizing the acid. In cases of severe poisoning, you have to use charcoal. So we do charcoal tablets. Um, with that charcoal, we get one of these handy dandy little pill pushers. I put two charcoal tablets there. Get this to the back. Notice all these lacerations. This has not been used very much. That's where the goats would have got me with their teeth. Okay, so these are really worth the couple bucks you're gonna pay for them. Um, this is the size you want for a goat. They sell these great big pill pushers for cows and horses that are three times this size. Don't bother getting it because it's not gonna fit in your goat's mouth properly. This is the size that you need. And these are offered at Tebow's Poultry down uh, in Spencer. So if you need these and you don't know where else to go, go to Spencer. Okay, Tebow's Poultry. But that, if I was to say, the few things that I always keep on hand, I would say a drencher, I'd say um, that, a few extra things, a thermometer, one that you're not gonna keep in the bathroom where your children are gonna be getting their temperature taken with. This one stays in my goat box. Um, natural remedies, VetRx is a really good old time remedy. It's great for pneumonia and clearing up um, uh, breathing issues. It also helps with mites, so you can use it a few drips in their ears too. Um, but going back to housing, I, I kind of divert, diverted a little. Going back to housing, you can house them in a three-sided shed. If it's deep enough that they cannot get rained on or snowed on, okay? So you can use a calf shelter or things like that. Do not coat your goat at the beginning of fall because you think they're cold. Let them grow in their natural hair. You're not gonna help them by putting a coat on them that can get damp and they can't take it off. When your coat gets wet and you get caught in the rain, you take your coat off, you hang it up to dry. They can't take they the coat off. With their fiber, their fiber will stand up on end and if you let them grow natural, they'll get a cashmere underneath that will lock in their body heat and the guard hairs will help to repel the weather. Saying that goats do not like rain. Once in a while you'll have a goat that likes rain. It's very unusual. Goats, the one illness that we usually watch for is pneumonia. These are an animal that were created to live on mountaintops. They like dry, arid places. So if you're building a goat shed, don't insulate it and shut the windows tight to keep the cold out. Okay, keep. If you've got a really tight shed, you've got to leave the window cracked open so that you get good air circulation. Because um, the one thing that will, um, they, they can, they have such a high immune system, they can fight off almost every disease. 
pneumonia is their one thing that they're not they're not able to. So if your animal goes off their feed, take their temperature, figure out what's going on. First thing, temperature. A normal goat temperature is 102. 102 to 103. When you first get your goat, several occasions using the same thermometer, just kind of figure out what's the norm for your goat. If you get that goat and his temperature says 105, try a second thermometer. And if you're still getting 105, call the vet because you just bought a sick animal. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind while you're, while you're looking at it. Um, we have what's called solar barns. A lot of people will put up carports, which are basically the same thing. Solar barn is the fancy way of saying an unheated greenhouse. The sun heats that up. Um, I will tell you, it's my favorite place to be in February. Um, I was such a traditional farm girl. I really believed in having traditional barns. Um, I was working with a grant and needed to put in a new facility because my herd had outgrown the multiple buildings that I put up for them. And we wanted to consolidate into a more efficient uh, method of cleaning our barn. So um, in that journey, a fellow from the University of New Hampshire came down and recommended the solar barn. I laughed. I said, I'm not putting up a motel for my goats. Sticks will come through. The, the weather, they're, they're just not safe. The bears will go through the plastic. I mean, I had a list of reasons. And then I spoke to a friend from Western Mass. And I said, what do you think? I was, I was consulting with her. She said, let me talk to a few of my friends who have cows. When she got back, she said, why didn't I do this research? She said, it's wonderful. She said, go and try them out. So I went to a few farms that actually had this. I went to a few farms with the regular Morton big metal buildings. I went to a few traditional farms and of course I had sheds already. Um, you know, small 10 by 12 barns, I call them. More of um, the backyard shed kind of thing. And I will tell you that I will never give up my solar barns. Non-taxable in my town, most towns, uh, the advantage is it's non-taxable. So I have a 40 by 60 foot barn that I don't have to pay taxes on. Because when I move, if I move, I can take it down and take it with me. Um, heating, it's got really good aeration. You have a good cross venting. You can take and roll up plastic, leave it down. We do double plastic on our solar barns and we put a small inflation. That helps to circulate air between those two layers, giving us a 2.8 insulation rating in the winter, which helps the snow to slide off. If you have one layer of plastic on your hoop houses, then you're going to have to tap them during the winter to keep the snow from building up and collapsing your facility. I will say that a couple years ago when we had that deep October snow, um, a lot of my friends lost traditional barns. Their roofs collapsed because of the weight of the snow. My greenhouses, the snow slid right off the top. So if I needed to, I could stand up on something and give it a couple of bounces and it just slides off in sheets. The only thing that I want to caution you if you go this route, make sure that you have enough clearance on the side to use a snow blower or be able to shovel the sides. Because the one disadvantage with the solar barn is your snow will all slide down into piles on the side. The plastic heats up, it creates ice. That snow starts to wade in, it can crush the sides, collapsing your, your building from the sides. So as long as you keep the snow back from your sides, you'll be fine. So either have a, an area that can be plowed, shoveled, or snow blown. Um, it's very spacious. It's easy to clean because I can go in one end with a tractor and out the other. Um, you can get garden carts and things in here, whereas small traditional barns, you creep down in. You know, if you only have a chicken coop and you want to add a few goats, you can do that. Just be aware that in your future, you might want to expand by doing a carport or um, a greenhouse type structure. What we do do is goats will eat your plastic. So now that I've told you this, be aware, you need to build a frame on the inside. So what I actually did was I went to a greenhouse going out of business and they had those plant tables. So they already had fencing on them. And uh, apparently it was their last day of their clearance sale and they said, if you come back before six o'clock, you can have all these plant tables. I went home and got my 18 foot trailer and went back and we had that stack so high, I can't even imagine. But we got all those home and we just lined them up. And all we did was do plastic strapping to 
each of my poles, just stood them up on end. We have a beautiful wall on the inside. The goats cannot chew. So, and then on the upper half, we have an extra bit of fencing that goes up a little higher because all goats can stand on their rear legs. You don't want them chewing your plastic. Having said that, many of you will come to my house and see that my door windows have been chewed by plastic. So far, to my knowledge, we haven't had any goats die from it because Hershey is still alive and he's my most notorious. I have a male that is 250 pounds uh, in his prime and uh, he stands on his back legs. He can definitely reach something eight or 10 feet high. So keep your, keep your fencing up there. Um, automatic waterers, for those that can afford to put in an automatic water, there's two styles. There's one that'll keep you in the summer. Hauling buckets of water when you have a couple of goats is fine. Some of you may not have a good back. You may be thinking, hey, I want to have these goats into my senior years and hauling, you know, 50 or 90 pounds of water up the hill does not sound like a good thing. Well, I'll tell you from my experience, my automatic waters are my lifesaver. I never thought that I would invest in this particular item. I thought it was not necessary. And then the amount of mud the goats made from dumping the buckets of water when they wrestled or played, um, it, it, it sold itself. These, these um, are work like a toilet, they just refill themselves. So you do have to invest in a little bit of plumbing to get them out there. If you go with the automatic waterers that will keep it thawed in the winter. So these can be put in a pasture. These can be in your barn year round because there is a heat element just in the dish. So if the snow piles up, um, there'll be a little cave-in spot and there's the water. So um, the other style waterers that you can do is there's these little automatic bowls. Um, and you can get them for like $35 to $80, depending upon whether they're stainless steel or not. And uh, those particular ones, you run a garden hose to. So those will run you about, you know, half to three quarters of the year. You can use those. And the goats just drink out of it. You swish the bowl once a day, and it'll refill itself. So that's a good option for those of you that want to get away with, you know, a, anywhere from $14 to, to $40. Um, usually for those type automatic waterers. They can be as much as 80 if you're getting a big one. We did a little wood frame so that we could move them around our yard. So those of you that don't, you know, want to see these papers, I can send you it. Um, really quick, so anybody have any questions about housing? Do you have any any suggestions or you want to post? Yes. What's the best way to keep up predators? Predators. Um, good question. You can use electric, but if the wild animal does not respect electric fence, it will push through. So the best combination is usually, if you're gonna use electric, is electric over something else. So a traditional fencing, um, you can get the Home Depot tractor supply two by four inch soft fencing if you want to spend 50 to $60 and get a large piece up right away. Be aware that you're gonna to have to walk that fence line a lot because the goats will find a way to break it and on the long haul they're going to destroy a lot of your fencing you're going to be spending a, a replacement game i will say that stock fencing livestock fencing no. the square panels they come in 16 foot sections um that is probably the most effective efficient way but fox can get through this is the first year that I've discovered that we have some skinny fox in our area and they've been cutting through my farm. So we're gonna add an electric wire to our fence or along the outside of the fencing to keep them out now. Um, but uh, definitely they have special goat fencing. You can get wire fencing, you can get that put up. Um, so if you ever wanna stop by my farm, you're all welcome. Uh, give me a call and set up a time and you can come out and check out. I have three or four different types of fencing up in my yard. So um, we have the traditional fencing. I don't know if I have pictures on this particular outline. Usually when I teach a university class, I have different, different materials I cover. But um, we usually do a goat livestock fencing, which is, um, it is a twisted wire fence. Those are really, really solid. Um, and we do those with heavy, deep fence posts. And then we do one wire electricity over the top. Um, and that keeps the fox and other animals out on those parts of the property. If you're getting Nigis, livestock fencing will not work unless you use it in conjunction with something with smaller holes. 
Um, having said that, I also know that Nigis are really good at climbing up, so just make sure your fence is high enough because they will maneuver, stand on here, and then bounce up over the top if they can. Think about when you're putting play things in their pen, that those things are located far enough away from the side. Um, the location of my truck and this was about how far, oh, maybe a little closer, right to the edge of this fencing, was about how far the end of my chicken house was to my stock fencing. And my Nigerian buck would take this little dance and just fly over the top of the stock fencing. Never had a La Mancha climb out of the fencing. I've seen one this year that actually climbed up two steps, which was amazing. She loves grape leaves, so she found a way to climb. But um, definitely the Nigis, if you're going with Nigis or, or Pygmies, you're going to need higher fencing. So keep that in mind. Usually, um, I would say five, five foot fence is the best, but if you get a four foot fence, as long as you're watching that in the winter, that the snow doesn't pack up too high so that predators can cross over the top, you're good. Um, hay feeders. Goats need hay. Preferably not eat in the way I have them demonstrated here. We usually have hay racks that we hook on them. Because this is a soft fence, I didn't want them stepping on it and then pulling this down while I was talking. So, um, so I don't have a hay rack in here. But you do not want to feed your animals off the ground. A lot of horses and things people feed off the ground, preferably not with goats because their poop can carry parasites. Those parasites will climb on their feet. So you're ingesting parasites into other animals that may be not as healthy or as strong. Um, and so they will end up picking up those parasites and it can cost them their life. Um, all right. So I'm gonna go through really quick what farm tasks you have to do. So for feed, the necessary things for animals to be fed, just to recap that, we need fresh water twice a day. Um, we need fresh hay. Preferably second or third cut. First cut means it's the first cut in the season, not that it's the top quality head. So first cut is usually traditionally given to horses because a high, a high protein diet can affect their, um, they can get colicky and stuff. So, so um, if it's a good quality first cut that was cut in a really good season and you just got it, I always feed first cut when June comes around. It's a good quality good. hay because that's the freshest stuff that's out there. But as it ages, it loses more because it's more stems. Goats are finicky eaters. They actually prefer going through and eating all the leafy parts. Um, even when they chew brush and things, if you give them too large an area, what they're gonna do is eat their favorite stuff and they're gonna leave stuff. So if you're doing, if you'd like to use these for grazing, you wanna put them in an area, leave them there, and then move your fencing. That is the preferable way of doing it, so that you are getting, you're also leaving their stool, which could carry parasites in that area. You're moving them to a fresh area, so they're not eating over where they've gone to the bathroom. Goats are one of the pickiest eaters. If a goat has gone to the bathroom there, the other goat will not eat it. So you're gonna have to make sure your rotation is such that um, it gets a little rain, so that they're, they're not finicky. I, I've tested them with apples, goats love apples, um, we have an apple tree, and I know people say not to give them too much apples. Too much of anything is bad. This is a ruminant animal. It means it has a four-part stomach. Whenever you give them something to eat, those changes have to be introduced slowly. You don't give them a bushel of apples. You give them a part of an apple or one apple. You don't give them a lot of them. So um, we would come out, we'd give our goats a fresh apple. If she tried to be greedy and she bit it and it popped out of her mouth and touched the ground, she would sniff it, everybody else would sniff it, and they'd walk away. I actually tried, once they broke it with their teeth, I brought it in the house, I washed it. I brought it out. Now, I'd been feeding them all kinds of apples from my hand. I get, went to give them that one, they could actually tell that one been on the ground, they wouldn't eat it. So, they are finicky eaters. They are actually less likely to carry parasites for that reason. But overgrazing or leaving them in the same spot without cleaning that area well you will end up with a parasite problem. Um, so for feed, hay, water, grain if you're doing milkers or you're raising meat animals. Okay, if it's a production animal, you're gonna add grain. 
If you have a pet and you want to give it grain because your quality of your hay is not good, then stick to the ration suggestions. And don't no, buy an all-purpose feed. I will say this, no, and I anybody no, that, you know, here? is a tractor supply distributor yeah, or whatever, here. I do just need to give this one warning. There is an all-purpose feed that's at the bottom end of um, monetary costs. It comes in a 50-pound bag. It's called an all-purpose feed. Do not feed that to your goats. It, it does not have the copper that they need. Sheep do not need copper. Um, sheep can get toxicity from copper. Goats need copper in their diet in order to have healthy hooves and other things. If you feed that all-purpose feed, your animals will either end up undernourished or overweight. Um, I say that because of an experience with a neighbor who um, was using that feed and the metabolic issues that we had to try to solve for her animals were huge. So I suggest you don't use an all-purpose feed, use a goat feed, specifically for you know, a ration that will be good for them, or use a whole grain diet. Um, grooming is minimal. So the other thing that I want to say, you need to have presents. So we have water, hay, possibly grain. When you put out grain, never give it to them, never offer it to them in a dish all day long. They get it, if they're just a maintenance animal, they get it once a day, in the dish, on the wall, never give them more than they can eat in 10 minutes. If you leave the dish down, you're overfeeding them. So, only 10 minutes, remove the feed. You can cover it, you can give it back to them later with something else added on top. They will get a little grouchy when you feed one animal to another. They can smell somebody else has been eating it, so we usually talk to them. But, um, but that's, that's my recommendation on feeding. The other thing you want to have is bacon soda, free choice, salt, free choice, and minerals, free choice. Now, mineral salts have trace minerals, not enough minerals. So unless you're feeding a grain that's a complete ration, usually I still recommend that you do a free choice mineral such as Blue Seal Minimix, uh, Minivite. Uh, Minivite's a little lighter on, on the mineral side. Um, there's a couple of goat ones that you can get um, in smaller quantities, uh, golden goat or um, some other variety. Um, most of your companies have a, um, a mineral that you can leave free choice. Goats are smart enough that when their diet doesn't feel balanced, they'll go over and eat that themselves. So leave that free choice and also always keep the bacon soda out there in case they eat poisonous plants. Your, your yard is full of things that, you know, you get one rain and suddenly you got buttercups and other things that are toxic that might be growing in there, blowing from your neighbor. So keep that in mind. Healthcare, that can be as, as much as you do for your dogs and your children, or it could be um, that you're a natural person and say, no, I'm not bringing them to the vet. That's totally up to you. Goats um, do not get brucellosis or tuberculosis unless uh, from, from um, even when they did a test in the 1950s, they put um, goat, uh, goats w in with, healthy goats in with cows and sheep, and they ran a study, and they said, well, let's see, these, these sheep and these cows have brucellosis and tuberculosis. Let's see if the goats catch it. The goats didn't catch it, so then they injected them. The goats got it. So they have a very high white blood cell count, which makes them resistant to disease. Having said that, if your animal is underweight, body scorings are important. Run your hand on their backbone. If you can feel a very tented back, backbone, then, you, then your animal could be either underweight or it could be running parasites that are taking all that nutrition from them. So, um, but otherwise, the goats who are a very healthy animal, they can graze, they can browse. If you have a lot of area, you don't have to offer a lot. You give them a little hay in the morning, and then you turn them loose on the pasture. We do it in that regard. Even if you're going to naturally rear your goats, you should give them hay first thing in the morning. That gives them some dry matter to pull and absorb some of the extra dew and stuff that they're eating so they don't get bloat. So hay also works as a buffer in their system. So that's all they need for food, shelter, food, and water. Um, birthing, if you decide you want to have baby goats, that's a whole nother field. You have to decide whether you're going to naturally rear them or are you going to bottle feed them. The pros and cons. Um, now, yes, you know, I raised my children naturally, but I raised my goats on bottles. And I do that for two purposes. Number one, 
to have 120 baby goats running underfoot of 70 adult goats means that there's going to be a lot of tragedies. And I don't want that. Number two, it's extremely difficult on my does that are having babies to bond to that baby and then have that baby removed from them. I cannot increase my herd by 100 animals every year. So my solution is to get them into good homes. In order to get them into good homes, I need to do that as soon as possible because everybody loves the little baby. How many of you can honestly say your eyes were drawn to this animal first? Probably not many of you. Most of you are going to say, oh, that little brown one, she's so cute. Why? Because she's little. So, unfortunately, marketing is the same. If I want that animal to get the best possible care it can have, I need to get it into the hands of a person who cares for that animal. Because there will be a point where they get to their teen stage, and they're a little annoying, and then it'll, it'll dissipate. But in order for you to survive that, you have to have bonded with them. So, if I can get that animal rehomed to somebody when it is... Um, you know, over a week old, you know, in that, in that, in that stage from, from um, say, a week and a half to, to three months old, that animal is probably guaranteed that they're going to stay in that home for a long time. Or, if the person can't have them, they're going to be conscientious on how they rehome that animal. Um, people that come in on a whim and say, oh, I want to go, and then they take it home and they don't realize they don't come to a class like this, they're not going to be concerned about what that animal's future is. They'll dump it off at an auction or they'll just put it on Craigslist and it's gone. Um, having said that, Craigslist is not a bad place. I don't want to be portraying that. I think that you can meet a lot of good farmers that way. I do advertise on Craigslist because it is my opportunity. If people are looking for goats there, then that's where I'm going to find a lot of good people. So, um, birthing. I'm always there present for the birth. If you are going to natural rear, you're going to let your doe have a baby by itself. You should still mark when that doe came into heat, when she was bred. If you don't have it marked, you're going to mark it, mark it on your calendar. The gestation for goats is uh, between 145 and 155 days. They can go as low as 140. Um, I've had them as low as 142, not usually 140 unless they're a preemie. So, um, if you can mark that, that's great. Having said that, those of you that might have males and females on your farm will find that they um, occasionally find convenient ways to beat each other when you didn't intend them to. So you may not know how many does were bred if the male gets in with your female. So watch for signs of pregnancy. Uh, those signs are swelling of the udder. Um, their back section right here near their vulva, near their tail area, will start to get um, expand. Their hip bones will come out a little and they'll start getting soft, softer and more, um, their vulva will get um, um, softer and more expanded. And that's to ready them for that birthing process. So those are the things to look for. Um, if your animal runs into a problem and you don't have all the equipment that I might have at my farm. Number one, call somebody if you know. One of the best things to do when you start into goats is get a buddy, somebody else in your community, so you can actually both have a vacation by swapping chores. Somebody you trust. Also, biosecurity, very important. Um, I don't go, I don't bring my animals to places usually. Um, this, is, this is a rarity, but when I do take them elsewhere, even at the Big Mo, those of you that might have come to the Big Mo last week would see that we make you sanitize your feet before you enter their actual pen. And what we're trying to do is teach you that where you've been, you can pick up parasites. Those parasites can be brought to these animals. These animals have never been exposed to Gerardia, which they haven't. And we bring them, you know, we bring, you walk in with your shoes, you've just been through tractor supply, and the guy in front of you just went to an auction. He's got who knows what kind of germs and bacteria on his feet. You are going to pick those up on your feet and you're going to trek them into your barn. Just step in a quick bleach water solution, vinegar, whatever you want to do for your natural solution, but step into that for a, you know, a couple of seconds and then step out. That is going to kill those eggs from being carried to your animal. Things like Yoni's disease, you don't want to think about that. None of us want to look at the diseases that animals can get. There aren't many they can get, but if they get that, your herd is going to, you know, the vet is going to ask you to cull your herd. And culling means that all of your animals get put to death or get put for meat. 
And that is really hard when you build up a herd. So, you know, definitely use, use some precautions. And that is just one step you can take. You can just use a spray bottle, bleach water, spray the bottoms of your feet, then go on with your day. So I do recommend practicing a little biosecurity. You need to think about different animals. So your friend doesn't have a goat, he has a dog. Jardia can be carried from dogs. Dogs swim in the pond, they swim in the river. There's beavers there. Beaver fever is the other name for that Jardia. So um, you and your friends may not have the same parasites. I don't have threadworm, I don't have pinworm. I don't have whipworm. We were able to eradicate that from our herd many years ago. So, but having bought in goats from different herds when I started, I ended up with these things. And um, I lost three does in the month of December one year. It was heartbreaking. I had to stay in, figure out what's going on. There were goats dying all over the state. And in my case, it was whipworm. And usually the, bur the worms are in hibernation, so you don't have a problem. We had a quick, warm December. It took them out of hibernation, and while the does were pregnant, their body was stressed. So we lost three does to it. So, and of course, that was Christmas, New Year's, and the day after New Year's. So those were the days when you have trouble getting your animal to a laboratory to figure out what's going on. So, anyway, have a vet when you get when you when before you get an animal, plan your your housing, plan your fencing, plan your food and water where your sources are, and then um, make sure you have a vet. Usually more than one. You, just because you have a vet for your dog, he probably doesn't do goats, okay? If you're a horse person, you go, well, the farrier will take care of my horse's ho goat's hooves. For whatever reason, those naturally reared with horned goats have left a bad impression on most of our farriers and they don't want to trim goat wolves. So you may have to look to your 4-H community to find somebody else to cut hooves if you don't want to do it yourself. Um, they like rocks. Rocks will keep their hooves ground down. Um, it'll keep their feet healthy. Uh, are all of you comfortable? You're okay? Okay. Because I know it's getting sunny on some of you, so I don't want to leave you in place if you're uncomfortable. So basically, the basic care that we have to do with our goats um, we have to groom them. Um, it can be as simple as just going like this and letting their hair brush out. You can brush your goats. Um, I don't brush my goat's teeth, but you could use a dog toothbrush if you're going to be that particular. I kind of like to keep my fingers out of their mouths. They're not particularly fond of stuff like that. I figure as long as they're eating browse, they'll, they'll clean their own teeth. So. Um, so I don't do stuff like that. Basically with me, especially with having a large herd, we brush our animals whenever we have company. It's nice to have a few extra brushes around. Um, we did learn this from the Jackson um, Zoo down in Jackson, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, that um, they don't feed their goats there. And I like that because a lot of places you go to do the petting zoo thing and they have you give grain. Well, what they don't tell you is they will always have losses in their herd. So you go back there and, you know, the cute little black and white goat is no longer there and you think, oh, they rehomed it, maybe. Or that animal got ruminitis from eating too much just grain, okay? So you're going to throw off their, their rumen because this is a four-part stomach. When they're a baby, um, babies focus on the abomasum. The abomasum is where they digest milk. So you cannot give a baby... You go, oh, this baby doesn't like milk. She's three weeks old. I'm weaning her. That goat will probably die. Okay? They need to have milk for a minimum of six weeks, usually six to 12. I lean on the three-month score, and I know that that is costly for me, being in business. The reason why is you get better bone density. I want healthy animals. I don't need them to be small. I want them healthy. So in order to create healthy animals, that's what we do. We give them milk until they're in that two to three month range. They'll start to wean themselves or I'll start to wean them. Usually I can tell by their stools if they start scouring a lot, they're probably drinking too much milk because as they get a little bigger, they get really greedy and if you're mass feeding them, they will drink too much milk. But the abomasum is very important. You cannot take a newborn baby goat. I will warn you too, those of you that are going to bottle feed animals, you're going to rescue a baby goat. Some farmer 
the mother goat died and the farmer doesn't want to bottle feed it and you heard about it and you run down and you get that goat. And then you run down to your feed supply store and you pick up this powdered solution. It's formula, it's goat formula, right? Don't give it to them. Um, I've had more people come to get replacement baby goats because their baby goats died from formula. It binds the little philias in the intestine. I'm using that word, not sure what the exact term is. My vet says the little fingers in the intestine is the way he likes to describe it. But there are little fingers in the intestine that help to absorb nutrients. The formulas bind around that. They rot them off, they break off, and then they hemorrhage to death by bleeding. So do not feed them formula. Now some of you might say, hey, I did it. I, I gave them formula. Maybe you had the right mix. Maybe you didn't do it for a long period of time. But I am going to recommend that you either give them raw cow or raw goat from a healthy herd. Okay, um, having said that, you need to know whether that herd is healthy, so go with an honest farm. Go there and see. Don't buy a gallon of milk at the curb with them. Ask to see the herd. If that herd looks mangy and dirty and they're living in dirty quarters, don't get their milk. You know, you'll find another source. Um, you can also freeze goat milk. So. Um, if you can't get milk from somebody close to you, you can take a trip out to a farm like mine or another goat farm that's reputable. You can get a larger quantity of milk, freeze it in small portions, just take out a bottle at will, thaw it, and feed your baby. Milk should always be um, over 102. If you get into the 90s, the baby starts spitting the milk at you. They are very temperature sensitive. They like their milk to be between 102 and 110. Cool milk will get them to have diarrhea. We call it scours, which is the polite way of saying it. So if I use the word scours, I'm talking about diarrhea and it's not nice. So if you don't want them doing that um, on the farm, they can get dehydrated very quickly. Then you want to make sure that you're feeding the right temperature, clean equipment. You know, don't rinse that bottle and just shove it over. Milk has milk fats. Those fats have to be removed. Use a little soap and water, scrub them, then rinse them, then let them draw. So that's the best way to keep your goats healthy if you're dealing with babies. Babies will eat hay at a very young age. Day one, I've seen baby goats chewing on hay. They can't digest it yet, okay? Their rumen is too small. 70% of their stomach, of their four-part stomach, is their abomasum at that stage. As they switch into that older stage, between that two and three month mark, It'll be 70% of their body's digestion is the rumen and only, you know, 20 to 30 on the three other stomachs. So you also will notice that goats cough a lot. I have people come all the time and say, oh no, your goat has a cough. No, watch what they do next because these are ruminating animals. That means that they go out, they browse early in the day when it's shady and cool, then they lay down at noon and burp it back up. They rechew it and they send it to their next part of their stomach. First room in and then they send it down into these other compartments. So that they're getting more nutrition because they're rechewing it, they're adding saliva to it, which helps to break those grains down. So that is why they are very good at making feed out of things that other animals can't survive. In. So um, because they're a ruminating animal with a four part stomach, all your ruminating animals do that. Cows, goats, sheep, um, most of your, um, um, and um, alpacas, alpacas, I don't know if they're considered a true ruminating animal. I guess they are. Um, thank you. I'm going to take one sip, sorry. Thank you. She must have known I was sounding dry. All right. Um, and also, alpacas like a lot of the same plants. Um, I've never had a problem with my alpacas getting sick, even though... Um, they do get, a, they, you know, some people consider they should have about the same diet as a sheep, um, that they, they can't stand the higher copper. But I noticed that the difference between my goats and my alpacas, my alpacas are guardians in my herd, is that the goats will go and eat extra minerals and the, the alpacas are mostly grazers. So um, we don't have a problem even though we do feed um, or have fed goat feed to our alpacas in the past. So in limited amounts, we don't give them a lot of, a lot of grain. So uh, mostly we let them do natural grazing and hay. 
Um, so talking about vets, you have a vet. The reason you have a vet is if you have a temperature over 105, you need to do something about it. Okay, um, 100, I would say anything over 103, you start to be a little concerned and you watch it. 103 and a half, you start, you know, 104, that's when you start treating. So it could be that your animal's just sitting out in the sun and they've overheated, move them to another area, cool them down a little. If you're gonna get them wet, don't let them get a draft because then you're just gonna create an atmosphere of pneumonia. Um, basic thing that you're gonna have to do with these guys for care maybe. know how to pick them up so best way to pick them up when you're reaching down reach under the front legs lift them a little arm behind the rump hold them into you like this feet on top butt here the reason why they're rear end on this side this way number one if it's a boy you're not holding him right where he goes because boys mm, are not as careful as girls <laughs> Yes, you may take her around. Yeah, so this one is also a weird go. I will not recommend that you do this very often, but <laughs> this particular goat has taken a fancy to being held upside down. It's not good for her rumen, so we only let her do it in small portions of time. Um, probably as she gets a little older, she will no longer be allowed to do that. But this particular doe is very silly. Um, my mother came by recently and we had that chicken coop about this height and my mother went down to pet one of the goats and then she jumped on her back, turned upside down like this on her back. So my mother was like, um, I don't know what to do, I can't get her off and she held her head out, you know, looking upside down at her. So she likes to do a lot of things to get attention. Um, you'll find each one of them have their own personality. This particular doe is extremely sweet. She has blue eyes, which is... Um, which is rare in goats. Um, you'll find it more in the Nigerian. If you want to take her around, you can okay. too. Um, so just just walk around uh, the outside. It's eating the thing. Oh, <laughs> no. Nope. Yeah. So if you have strings or laces, I will say, sneakers without laces are great uh, <laughs> on a farm. Unless, of course, you want to tie your shoes a lot. It is a good way to get in your stretches daily. So, um, you know. You'll be, you'll be uh, tying them, but you'll also be fishing that slimy thing out of their throat, yeah. um, probably with a little room and ingredients on it, so it might not smell quite pleasant, so I would recommend <laughs> non-tying shoes or a pair you don't care about. Um, hoof trimming is going to be your major thing. Um, let me grab somebody else. Come here, baby. While oh, she's oh, taking yeah. that one around. Mm -hmm. it? These goats haven't had their hooves trimmed for a while. Now, when you saw them this way, they look really good. You'll notice the foldovers in the skin. I'm just going to take a quick walk around. And you see the foldovers here. All of that surplus, as well as the back pads that are overgrowing, have to be trimmed. We use a hoof shear. I didn't bring it today. I'm sorry. Um, I brought it to my last event and we trimmed hooves at the event. And unfortunately, I left it in um, one of my bins and I couldn't grab it quickly enough. But we're using um, the red-handled ones. Um, there's also another company that I got recently that have a shear. You can use regular pruners that you get for $3.95 from Walmart if you want. That has one sharp blade. It's just going to be a little harder. You've got something, tin snips. When I was young, my parents always used tin snips um, on it. That's what they called them. Um, but metal shears. So just about anything. Um, I found that planers and files are a waste of your money. I don't know if you guys can get the knack of it. Maybe it's just because I'm left-handed. I don't know. I think those planers are made for righties. But when I try to use it, I never really had good control. I'd rather uh, dress out with a utility knife. So if you're gonna do that, I recommend gloves, leather gloves when you're doing hooves because if you don't hold their legs still enough, they'll be calm, they're eating grain or something that you fed them, all of a sudden they just kick. And I have a lovely scar that runs here across my thumb because I'm left-handed, um, where the goat kicked up and sent my hand right into where her toenail was supposed to be. So I severed it to the bone. So it took me about six to seven months to even stop feeling that numbing sensation in my thumb. So uh, it did eventually heal, but nerves take a lot longer to heal. So I suggest leather gloves. Um, one of the other things we do with our herd, um, and I want to talk about that too. So this is a necessary thing. 
hooves have to be done. You will cripple your animal if you don't trim the hooves. Having large rocks and things for them to jump on will help them to wear down their hooves naturally. We have some breed lines that actually have better hooves than others. Um, some have what I call the boot style. They have a very large toenail and those ones have to be cut more regularly. And then I have the does that go, like they like to scratch like a bull. So they'll, they'll get over to a rock and they just scratch and scratch and scratch. So they keep their pretty pristine. So it's just a matter of a quick trim for them. So, um, but on the pads, um, sometimes when, when I first started doing goats 30 years ago, I never had the, the strength in my hand to be able to trim the pads well. So I used the utility knife as a finisher. So if you're having trouble with that, you're welcome to come down my house and practice. We take volunteers. Um, we can teach you how to do that, um, but also um, you can get in a 4-H'er from your area. Somebody that's, you just call your local 4-H extension and say, hey, I'd like somebody to come by and do this for me. Hooves have to be done. Um, some people will want to maintain shops. We are inspected by the state. The state does not require shots because rabies um, do not have a regulated dose for goats so it's kind of a guesstimated thing for them so you can get the rabies shot if you feel like that's going to give you prevention but be aware that if your animal has exposure to a wild animal that does not protect them from quarantine because there's no USDA um, dose amount you're still going to have to have your animal in quarantine regardless. But if you feel like you're going to get better protection, then definitely do that. Tetanus would be a shot that I would recommend uh, because they will chew on wire. They will chew wood, which means they have exposure to nails and other sharp surfaces that could be rusty, and their exposure to soil that could, could carry uh, tetanus. So those things, if you think that's an important thing to you, that's fine. Some of you may be a natural kind of a person. Um, you, will, you will say no shots for my animal. That's fine. As long as your animal's healthy, keep aware, be aware of what's going on with your animal and you'll be fine. The, the main thing that you have to be concerned about with exposure to your animal is cleanliness. If you keep your animal clean, your animal's not going to have E. coli. Okay? Your animal gets E. coli, it's because it's been exposed to manure that carries that bacteria. Or the animal was uh, immune deficient, so they picked up that bacteria. Because we're all exposed to it daily in some form or another, and we don't catch it. So um, brucellosis, tuberculosis, not a concern. The main concern would be tetanus um, for rusty things. But I will say that I've had goats chew fencing for years, and they work out little splinters through their cheek and stuff. You tell them not to do it, but you know, we wrapped our trees. We wrapped our trees with chicken wire and thought, wow, this is great. We can wrap it like six or seven times. They'll never get to it. I came out and there's a hole this big. I said, who ate the chicken wire? We had little abscesses in their cheek for the next three years, you know, because those little pieces of metal work their way through. So those things do happen. Goats will get abscesses. It doesn't mean it's CL, those of you that have been doing your homework. It doesn't mean it's CL just because they have an abscess. If it's in a known location, especially in the face, it's probably something they ate. They've got a picker that got stuck in their skin. They have a splinter or they have a piece of metal, something that barbed them. That will stay in the skin for a long time. It'll slowly work out to the surface. When it's ready to expel it, the body will create a pus around it so that, that it'll encapsulate it and then it'll explode. It's disgusting. You will have to clean it out and you'll have to flush it with hydrogen peroxide or iodine, but they'll be fine. And they will grow their hair back on their face where that spot is. You might want to shave that area just to keep the drainage good, um, but you won't have a problem with that. Um, some of us farmers that have had goats for years, we never bring them to a vet anymore. For, for abscesses. You only have to watch them once because then the vet says to you, okay, so take this home, this animal home, and for the next three days, keep recutting this open and flush it. I said, then what I pay him for? I got to do it still. So so some things you can learn, some things you may want to, uh, to you know, to um, 
push out to somebody else. But once in a while they'll get abscesses. It's not, it's not something that you have to be majorly concerned about. <laughs> the things you want to ask people about while they're getting animals is um, some people are concerned about CAE, so I'm going to talk about it really quick. CAE is caprine arthritis encephalitis. I do not test for it. The reason, cost inhibitive and false positives. So I do not feel like the tests that are out there represent animals that are truly sick. Um, if my two and a half gallon milking goat tests positive for CAE, am I going to cull her? Because your choices are, if they're CAE positive, what are you going to do? Are you going to put that animal down because it has the potential of getting a viral arthritis? Or are you going to uh, keep that animal? Most of us will probably keep the animal. If CAE is an important factor for you, then buy from, animal, buy from farms that are certified CAE free. That does not guarantee you will be CAE free. Because that test basically says, has this animal been exposed to this? It doesn't mean that they've caught it. They could be carrying an immunity to it. So whether it's immune or it is contaminated, it will test positive. If my two and a half gallon animal tests positive, I'm going yay who because she has skinny knees, she has never had mastitis, and I've had her for eight, nine years. So an animal that's never shown any of the other clinical signs, respiratory illness and other things, has shown no other signs for the disease, I would consider carrying the antibodies against the disease. That's just my personal thing. You decide what works for you. You may say she's way off base. That's fine. I don't mind being disagreed with on this subject. Um, I'm just throwing it out there. I've read several different things. Um, I still feel like um, that colostalum and milk should be given in its raw form um, rather than pasteurizing it. I feel like um, animals that receive pasteurized product do have a lower immune system because they're not getting those a active antibodies. So for me, all my animals are bottle fed. So they get their own mother's milk. I don't give them other milk unless I'm running really short. I will buy from one reputable cow farmer in my area and I'll mix cow milk, raw cow with raw goat and I will supplement with that. So I've never had a problem with raw cow. Never feed your goats. Baby goats, I just want to put this in too because I mentioned the powder, but I forgot to mention never buy store-bought pasteurized, ultra-pasteurized milk and feed your baby goat. It will die, okay? It will die from our store-bought milk because it doesn't have enough active flora um, or enough nutrients to sustain life. They will scour and they'll get sick. I only use uh, medications in case of life-threatening illness. I'm a natural girl, so all natural means have to be exhausted. And if I treat an animal traditionally, um, then I will take that animal off the milk line for a minimum of three months, possibly for the season. So my milk is never uh, antibiotic positive. We test every single batch of milk required by law, even though we don't give our animals antibiotics. So, uh, but I will say that I won't withhold uh, medication from my sick child, so I won't hold it from my goats. I feel like um, being a responsible farmer means that, you know, I, I do it that way. Some people use a strict culling order. An animal gets sick, you cull it from your herd. That is probably the best method of preventing illness in the herd. But you have to have the guts to do that. So um, I will say that you know, that, that, you know, you also need to be able to make those decisions wisely based on your own knowledge and choices. For me, um, if an animal has been a part of my family, every animal on my farm is named, and so every animal gets equal opportunity towards health care. So, um, preferably natural. So we use very simple things. Um, Resorb, if the animal gets diarrhea, especially baby goats or older does that get diarrhea, and it's just because they eat something off, Resorb will help. I love this stuff. Tebow's uh, poultry again, and Spencer carries this. Um, I, will, I will recommend her several times because she is the only local place. She's not local for me, but she's the only place I can call and say, well, you get this, this, this in. When I walk in, she says, go look at my shelf and tell me what I need for goats this week. 
and I give her a few suggestions, what seems to be running out, what she needs. So um, that I do recommend. Um, injection sites, two ways of giving injections, sub-Q or muscle. Muscle shots are usually taken in the leg, right in this leg right here. Um, being careful to kind of not hit a nerve. If you hit a nerve, they're going to go lame. It's going to make them a target to other animals picking on them. So if you're going to do a muscle shot, usually here, there's a couple, I think in the part of the leg sometimes you can go, but mostly it's in the back thigh uh, area for the, for, the, um, for the muscle shot, IM. If your medication says IM, that's the way you would give it. If you're giving an animal sub-Q, you're going to go behind the shoulders, lift, and you're going to just stick the needle under the skin, inject it in that way. It's a little slower process, but it's a little easier on the animal because they're going to feel uncomfortable because they got a little bulge under their skin, but they're not going to be, uh, you're not going to have the risk of hitting a nerve. So sub-Q is when you lift here, here, right here in front of the thighs. You're going to lift that skin up. Yes, I know you want to be picked up, huh? So you're going to lift that skin up, the loose skin, sorry, I'm so French I have to show everybody. But you're going to lift the skin up like that and you're going to inject down into it. I recommend a half inch needle. Most of your vet needles are going to come an inch or an inch and a half. You're going to, unless you're experienced with doing needles, that's going to scare you because the goat skin is not that flexible. So you're going to bring it up and you don't want to go in and out. So I would recommend half inch if you have the opportunity to purchase. I would do half inch 20 gauge. And you can get those in whatever size you need, whether it be, you know, a three ounce or, or you know, a three mil or uh, six to 12. You never need more than a 12. Uh, most of the time, I think Bovisera is about the, the highest thing you do is like a 10, five in two locations. Um, so body scoring, like I mentioned to you, you want to make sure that your animal has, when you come through, you guys can feel the backbones on these animals and see that they have a pretty good scoring. She's got a little bit more severe scoring, partly because of the body type. Nigees are short and stocky, and she's a leaner, more dairy-like um, fix. She's not tented too bad. She's got a little bit of a tent to her backbone, but it's not too severe. What do you mean by scoring? Scoring means that how deep does the backbone stand up in an arch like this? If you can feel a backbone up like this, there's something wrong. Either nutritionally, that animal has not been eating enough, or that animal has worms that are eating or digesting the feed. Um, also, you'll see it a lot with the barber pole worm. The barber pole worm has one tooth. Sorry, for those of you that don't like parasites, put your fingers in your ear for a minute because the barber pole worm has one tooth. It's called homunculus contortus. It cuts a hole. It has anticoagulant saliva so that the animal cannot form a blood clot. That animal continues to drip blood. He goes, oh, that was good. Sucks some blood. He goes over, cuts another hole, puts his anticoagulant. So what he's doing is, in essence, is he's bleeding the goat to death internally. So if you have a large amount of barber pole worms, they will nutritionally deplete your animal. And so you'll see a lot of this poor coloring. Also, another way to check them, those of you that are interested, is check the eye color. She's got nice pink eyes, skin. She has pink skin. You can also check the gum color. So gums and inside of the eyelids, they should be pink. Um, but check your animals when you first get them because some animals don't have the same color. So what's naturally pink for one animal may, may be right for them. It might be that you're seeing pink against black and it pops, pink against white, and it's more pale looking. So just you know, if you get a chance to do a Fomancha class or look online at information about Fomancha, it'll tell you a little bit about body scoring. So at this point, I would like to be able to open it up to questions. Yes? If you're new to this, is there a minimum herd size? Or Two. Single goat? Okay. Two goats, preferably. If you have other animals like horses um, and you get like a buck kid or something that's not going to be... You know, he, he, he'll, he'll, he'll go good with a horse or alpacas or something. You can do that. But um, they are herd animals, and all herd animals need at least another friend. If you don't, having said that, I have people that have been successful with one animal, but you are going to have to do an awful lot of attention on them. The minute you leave the house, they start screaming. 
So if you want to have happy neighbors, get two. Also, listen to the animal before you purchase it. You know, I say to my, my, my friends and people that come to me, that animal is part Nubian. She will be vocal. I want you to be aware, the longer the ears, the louder the voice. They, they just go together. So if you want the long ears, you gotta put up with the voice. It also means your neighbors have to. So first things first, have a friendly relationship with your neighbors. You know, bring them some goat milk fudge, give them some cheese and tell them, by the way, I'm getting a couple baby goats. If they make a lot of noise, please forgive them for the first two weeks. Because the first two weeks they're settling in. Any other questions that we have? Yes. Is there a problem if you don't milk? No, unless you breed it, that animal will not produce milk. Because these are mammals, and I forgot to say that, I appreciate you bringing that up, because sometimes, you know, because biology was my favorite subject, I forget that not everybody um, loved biology. Animals produce milk because they come into motherhood. So when these gestate, that brings them into milk. When they give birth, that brings them into milk so that they can supply milk for their babies. Having said that, if you milk every single day, especially if you do it two or three times a day, that animal can continue to milk for four or five years without being rebred. But if you stop milking or you cut them down to once a day, their lactation will drop. It's all about demand. If you ask for a lot of milk, they'll give you a lot of milk. If you don't ask for the milk, they'll dry off because they'll put their body's energies into something else. Anyone else with questions? Yes. Thoughts about free access to hay 24 hours a day. That's perfect. You can get the big round bales. They cost anywhere from 80 to $120, depending upon the size. Um, make sure it's a second cut or a third cut and it's not moldy. You can put that on a skid and then take one 16 foot cattle panel, stretch it around, and put dog clips on it. Those animals will work on that. You don't have to haul it in. You can get it dropped off. If you have a greenhouse style barn, you can get it dropped off right to the door and roll it in. We um, get ours from Hard Hardwick Farmers um, Hardwick from Steve Prouty, and uh, he drops them onto our truck. We take them off uh, manually because we didn't have any tines. So manually, my big old sons um, will get behind those bales with my husband. They'll push it off the truck. We'll roll it in, set the the skid right at the bottom and then tip it up onto the skid. You're never going to be able to move that bale in the other direction. You can also get the large bales and peel them. I will say it's a real pain if you have to peel them by hand. So when I go on vacation in January, I traditionally will go and buy, you know, four big round bales, get them set up in my barn so that the people coming in to check on my animals, my animals are dry, they don't need grain because they are pregnant. They're just eating second cut or third cut hay. Um, I'll leave them with that in my automatic washer, um, automatic waterer, and I can just have somebody come in, get their eyes on my dose, make sure everybody's healthy, and then they switch the water bowl and they go back out the door. So there is an advantage to the big brown bales if you have a very complicated life, you're a very busy person. There's no reason you can't have goats. Then you can spend the time with your animals, petting them and loving on them, some of you may not be able to lift a 45 pound bale head. There are also those big long square bales that are available for some people, but unless you have a tractor, you cannot get them off. They're four foot by eight foot long. So you'll have to break them, and even grabbing a slab of that was extremely difficult last year. We did do a few of the big square bales, but they're four feet long. So even a thinner slab is, um, is difficult to use. Yes. Thank you. That's, that's a really important thing. Yes, I do. Um, I'm a big advocate for dehorning. Those of you that love horned animals, please forgive me for, you know, stating my position on this. But um, if you go onto websites that say that dehorning is cruel, you will notice in the background when they take a picture of theirs that there's big holes in their fence. What they're not telling you is that an animal stuck its head through, backed up, started to strangle. If the animal could lay down and wait till somebody rescued it, that animal was rescued. Otherwise, that animal died from a cyst So, number one, for their safety, 
horns are a danger because we have to keep them safe from predators. Um, electric fencing, they're eating close to electric fencing. They hook their horn in. Now they've got this electric fence wrapped around them. Number one, they pulled down the fence. They might have neutralized it, but they've got a fence tangled up around them and they're in panic crisis mode. So they're gonna hurt other animals. They're gonna run over your baby goats. They're gonna hurt them. So, um, so I am a big advocate for their safety. Also, I grew up with goats with horns. We had Nubians and we would get right up to that last two or three weeks before birth. The females start getting a little hormonal. They get grouchy, start hitting each other. Four or five dead babies laying on the ground. Just so sad to have them so close to birth and lose them because a set of horns will disattach a baby and they'll abort. So, so for, for me, from my experience, I don't like horns. Now, if you disbud at four, four days to a month old, preferably three weeks or younger, but if you can disbud when there is almost no bump at all, at four days, at three days, their skull is still soft. At four days, it's firm enough. It is 10 seconds on each horn bud, burr, burr, pop them off. If you burned yourself on a stove and gotten a severe burn, you know what it feels like. If you've had a mole removed or you've had cancer spots removed, you've done it to yourself. So to think that this is cruel is not really a balanced position because we are actually preventing eye injuries. I don't want to explain to some mom that my goat is really friendly but when her three-year-old came up and the goat was eating and it went to pet it and the goat got startled and it took that child's eye out, I don't want to explain to her that I left those horns on. Now her child has only eyesight in one eye. It's not worth it, not for me. Now, are they beautiful? Yes. If you have meat goats, most meat goats or fiber animals, there's a purpose for it. Um, the heat, you radiate about 19% of your body heat, or goat does, um, out of their horns. Um, so by their, their vascular system being cooled, um, they're able to bring down their body temperature. So in the south, there might be a warranted reason for having horns. My take on that is that I've saved 19% of their body heat. We live in the winter. That means I've saved feed and resources that they no longer need. Secondly, it's not a danger to them, it's not a danger to somebody else. It's only 10 seconds of discomfort. You go over to that baby, you hand it a bottle, it'll drink. Now I will say that bucks, sorry, but bucks do cry more than females. Some females, you just bud them, they don't say a word. Most of the bucks, when you put them in the box, they start screaming. We put them in a little box, so only their head is out of the box. They're just laying down in there like a little box with a cutout. They lay down there, we hold their head still, which they don't always appreciate. We hold their head still and then we just buck. We do that so that we don't burn any other areas. The hair grows over it. All of these animals have been disbutted and as you can see, they don't miss their horns. If this doe had horns right now, that doe would be jumping away. She'd be in pain because this one would have gorged her. I will say that, you know, um, that a lot of miscarriages take place with horned animals. So that, for those of you that have horned animals, they are beautiful, okay? I don't, I don't disclaim that, but for, for my lifestyle, they're not worth the risk. If you have children or grandchildren or neighbor's children that might come in contact with your animal, your liability you have to consider too. So. What would you expect to pay for a good quality of Okay, so like a dwarf Nubian? I don't know on the Nubian. Now this is the thing, pricing is all about supply and demand. If somebody has two goats and they have three babies, they will convince you that they have the best goat and it's gonna cost you $600 a kid. They got the papers, they got this, they got that. I have papered animals and I will charge you $100 a kid, okay? So the difference is, how much do I want to get rid of my animal? How quickly do I want to move them? And still know that I'm getting good families. Just because somebody has more money to spend does not make them a better animal owner. I've had people tell me that I charge more money because I'm going to get a better owner. No, you're going to get an owner that has more money. 
It doesn't mean you got a better owner. I know a lady who's a single parent that has a herd of goats and she milks them every day and she buys from a CAE fresh vegetables and she does kibbutz on her counter and she's got all this, you know, she does kefir. So she lives healthy and yet she lives on a meager salary, but her animals never go hungry. I've also met people that had this big, beautiful house and they called me and said, you know, I, I can't have this animal. They had it for a week and they're like, I can't have this animal. And I went up there and I was never so happy to take an animal from somebody's property before. He's like, just come take this animal from me. I couldn't keep it because it had been exposed to somebody else's farm. So it was really sad that I couldn't keep it for myself. But I was never so happy. He had a piece of plywood with a scoop of grain that had been put on top of that plywood on two saw horses. It had rained the night before and it smelled putrid, like putrid. And he had this great big barn and his two goats were living in a little tiny Snoopy dog house with this one piece of plywood with a scoop of grain and the hay was at least three years old. He'd had it from his last horse. It was first cut and it was a minimum of three years old. It looked like straw. I was never so happy. He said to me, the baby goats keep crying. I don't know why. I walked in and I said, they can't see you from the house. They're new here. This is not proper feeding. This is not proper hay. I'll take them. You know, so, so that is, that is the situation. You can't, you know, so you could pay a lot for them. I'm not saying that you're not paying for good quality. If you're going to do showing and you have a child that's going to do 4-H, don't just buy any animal that's registered. Buy the one that's already doing well in show. Buy their kid. You got a 50-50 chance of getting those genetics. So, um, is that? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so your prices can go any, you can get animals for $5 a piece from the auction. But I will never, ever, ever tell you to go for that bargain. Because just stepping on those grounds, even if it was my animal, stepping on those grounds, two years down the road, you could end up with Yoni's disease. And now, your kids, your wife, you have to explain to them why they can no longer have that pet. Because it's going to get wasting away disease. So, anybody else have a question? Yeah. How much uh, land should you have to have, even if you're just having like two of them? Like, how, what size yard is big enough? Yep. It's really about um, your zones in your town. Because honestly, in Africa, they'll keep their animals in a little wooden structure to keep them free, safe from tigers and other predators. And they will go out into the woods and they cut the crops because in areas that don't get a lot of water, they have to control what is eaten so that they don't desolate their territory. So they'll cut limbs specifically and feed their animals. So as long as you're bringing hay to your animals, you know, this may be fine for today or tomorrow, but I want to take that animal for a walk mm -hmm. to get them that opportunity to run in a larger area. Um, you know, I don't want to, you know, they suggest 16 square feet per animal. I will say that goats never use 16 feet per square, you know, square feet per animal. They would never be that far apart from their herd mates. They'll all be on this corner, or they'll all be on this corner. You know, the boys will sub herd. So when we're in breeding season, we're not in breed. When we're in breeding season, we bring the boys in to our herd. They will um, breed ours. Then they go out of rut. They stay with our herd till they come back into rut in June. Got to watch the nigees because nigees can be bred twice a year. So that may not be a foreseeable option for you because nigees are from Africa and so they can breed more often. So, but with the Swiss breeds and your your more hardy dairy breeds, they breed once a year. So, and that can be anywhere from June to January. Um, any other questions? You're keeping a pair. Yes. Should you stay within, and you're not breeding. Yep. Should you stay within uh, breed, and uh, should you stay within uh, sex? No. Um, if you weather that animal, weathering is what we call when we neuter a male animal. With goats, it's called weathering. If you weather a male animal, you can keep him with a doe. 
So that's okay. Do not keep intact males and females unless you want babies. Okay, because they will breed and you will have kids. Um, and then you have the issue of disbudding and all that other stuff, rehoming the animal or expanding your herd as you, as you so desire. So um, you'll notice that I have La and um, I have La and I have Nubian and I have Nigerian in my herd. They get along fine. You will find that the Nigees, because they're the same age and the same size, tend to group together. Having said that, don't think just because that Nigee small, she isn't going to be the queen. One of them will be dominant, and Nigees have a much more distinct attitude towards fighting than La Mancha's. La Mancha's are more laid back, so even though she pushed them a couple of times, if she was a Nigerian in that size, she would have thrown them at that size. So it's all about attitude, good chemistry. Two animals don't get along, they'll never get along. You know, they'll figure out what their their thing is. Um, but usually, you know, goats are pretty flexible. They'll usually try to blend, especially if you bring them from the same farm, you can blend them. If you lose an animal, that animal that's left is in sorrow and it will bond very readily to another animal. So don't just throw it in with them though. Put a fence between them. So if you're gonna get animals from separate herds, put one thin fence like this so she can come up and she can push her head there and, I, and the other one can push her head here and they can bite at each other. And then they can step back and take a break and then they can go and they can mash heads and step back. But they can't be chased around, have their tail chewed off, you know, that kind of thing. So you don't want abuse. You don't want abuse. So if you if you got three animals and you say, oh, I absolutely want a Nige, and you throw it right in the pen with a settled herd, that animal is going to go under a lot of abuse because you've got three other animals telling it, I'm the boss. There is a hierarchy and you must respect the hierarchy. When you walk into a goat pen, your energy needs to be calm. You are in control. Do not walk in a scare because the animal's big. In the goat kingdom, the female is dominant. There's one queen. The males create a sub club. And yes, they're bigger and they can push their head into a hay feeder and they can boss the girls around. But most of the time, the males will not do that unless he's neutered. Maybe that'll change his attitude. But the males won't do that. The female, there'll be one female that runs the herd. The males will segregate together. I have two Nigerian bucks and I have a 250 pound male and they sleep together every night. So if this goat is sassy me, you're gonna say, oh, she's so cute. You know, she's little. She wants to jump up and she wants to reach me. So she's standing like this, bad idea. Three-year-old comes in your yard, that's where their eyes are. Don't let a Nigerian, just because they're small, get away with them. If you want to pick them up, you pick them up. When they go to jump on you, do the same thing you do with a dog. No, if they're being bad or sassy, you trip them and you hold them down on their side. If they're a larger animal, you straddle them on their shoulders like this. Now, when she settles like she is right now, that means I submit, you're the boss. Okay, you have to do that with your young animals. If you play headbutt, I'm gonna say this directly to the guys, because, <laughs> because, sorry, but it's true. Guys like to play those roughhouse games. It's in your nature. But if you play roughhouse with a buck kid, and when he gets to be 250 pounds, he doesn't understand that anything has changed between you and him. So when this child comes along, he goes, oh, look, New guy in the place, wham, that child's hurt. So don't play roughhouse. There'll be a point where you won't like it. You won't like it if the male's trying to dominate you and urinate on you or something. So if the animal tries to show you any aggressive behavior, if the animals try to lick me, males do this blah, 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 thing with their tongue. If he tries to do that, I push him away and say no. If he doesn't obey me, I can knock a 250 pound buck on the ground. It's just a matter of coming in behind them, pushing your shoulder and grabbing the two legs and tipping them sideways. Never drop them right on their rib cage, always on their side, and you will not injure them. Look around you, don't drop them where they're gonna smash their head on a rock. Shaving and shearing. Um, if you're gonna show goats, you do have to shave and shear them. If your animal get lice, the easiest way to get rid of external parasites is to shave them down. So you will shave them down. You can use uh, diatomaceous earth, and you can use um, 
uh, pimethrin powder um, for them. Um, that helps, or you can use um, CV80D, which is a, a product that's a spray version. Don't use the spray in the winter. You can use that most of the other seasons, not in the winter. You don't want to chill your animal. Um, first aid, mostly, I mean, the goats are pretty, pretty agile. Even if they break a bone, they heal very well. So they can, um, I've also seen goats with only three legs. So if your animal does, for some reason, have a catastrophe with a car or something, Hopefully not, but if they were to have access, they can live with just three legs. Um, I know there's a goat up at um, Heifer Project um, and they at Overlook, and they had two legs missing. And so the animal gets around just on its two front legs. Um, she's really, really fat. So I haven't seen her for two years, so she's probably still up there. Um, if you're going to do milking. Get sanitary equipment. You don't need anything fancy, but this this is helpful. That's not sanitary. <laughs> but um, because I am in a dairy, we have a lot of moisture, so it builds up on everything, so everything has these water spots. I would sanitize this before I used it. But this is called a moon pail. Basically, you're going to milk by setting that under the udder, and you're going to shoot it straight in. When you milk, you always want to be facing the goat's tail. You sit alongside their shoulder, facing their tail. Some cultures milk from the back, but most of the breeding that's gone into dairy animals in this country is so that they're front-facing milkers. Um, I say front-facing because their teeth come at a slight angle forward. So you're going to reach under here and milk this way. Um, poisonous plants, definitely look at, look at what's listed. I do have a friend who does not feed any grain to his goats just hay or grazing and he said that the rumens are so healthy that his animals eat some poisonous plants without harm um, he also keeps bacon sort of there for them but he's able to get away with some um, showed you the um, trail training would be just um, teaching them to leave you want to teach them to walk on a leash when you use um, a collar with them and I don't have my collar here right now Always pull the collar up under the chin, so you have the collar here and right here. I use breakaway collars. You can go down to Dollar Tree or some other store and get the ones that have the little plastic clips. Um, they're not proven. Your goat can still choke with those, but um, they're more apt to break them. So it's a small investment, and it's easier to handle them. So when we do, always pull from here. If you pull back here, you're chopping off their air. If, you're, if you call me and say, my goat's shaking like convulsively and it fell on the ground, I'm going to say to you, did you pull them from behind? Tie staking, I don't recommend it, but some people do practice it. If you're going to tie stake your goats to be able to use an area, make sure you don't have predators in your area, neighborhood dogs, and make sure you're out there. Do not leave them unattended. They get their rope tangled, they get it wrapped around their foot, around their neck, they're going to die.